Hello, and welcome to the Zero to Hired podcast, the show that helps struggling job seekers find a career that's right for you. In every episode, we have one mission, to provide you with unique tips and strategies from leading industry experts that will get you in front of hiring managers. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Zero to Hired podcast with our special guest today, Mark Robinson. Mark Robinson has over 30 years of leadership experience in Canada and the UK, and Mark has led and coached thousands of individuals in both corporate and personal settings. He is currently the Managing Director for Eagle Continuum Consulting Limited in the UK, where he provides consulting and coaching services. Mark is the creator and author of two books, The Eagle Continuum and Eagle Continuum Part 2, a how-to guide for shitty leaders to become less shitty through active leadership. Please help me welcome Mark Robinson. Hey, hey John. Thank you, Fred. Hey. Hey, hello. <laughs> I never get tired of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, today I'm pretty excited. We get to, I get to use language I don't normally get to use on my show because we're all about talking about how not to be a shitty leader, right? Right, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, That's great. So, yeah, so let's get right into your story, Mark. And, and I'm sure my audience is pretty interested in hearing how did you come upon this topic and how did you make this transition into this sphere of work that you're doing today? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So, you know, I started in leadership back when I was 19, working in telecommunications in Canada. And I was promoted because I was a good call center advisor on the phones. And one of the things that I learned very quickly on was just because I was really good at one job, doesn't necessarily transfer into being good in a leadership role. And so I realized very quickly that I had a lot to learn. And, you know, I, I self-proclaim I'm a reformed non shitty leader. So, you know, I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt and all that fun stuff as I try to sound younger than I am. So, you know, it's really about um, understanding the concept and the whole terminology behind what shitty leadership means. And I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a great ride so far. It's been a lot of fun. So, so, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of, a lot of my audience must be wondering, so what does it mean? So how do you define, or what would be your definition of a shitty leader? So a shitty leader, first, my normal disclaimer that I say all the time, uh, it's supposed to be that whole concept of shitty leadership is supposed to incite some sort of reaction, right? And clearly it does. And most of the time it's humor, which is what it is intended. But the first disclaimer that I have to say for you and of course your audience is that Shitty leaders are not shitty people. It's not about blaming and shaming. It's not about trying to call people out and make them feel bad or incite a reaction where they choose to feel whatever it is that they feel. It's the concept of understanding that your behaviors determine how you're perceived as a leader. And so what shitty leadership does is that it forms this sort of unanimous um, approach and perception within the world, within the marketplace. You know, if I give you an example, when I was working on book one and solutionizing the title, so the tagline is a how-to guide for shitty leaders to become less shitty through active leadership. I showed that working title to about four or 500 people of about six, seven months, standing in line at the grocery store, job. you know, being out and about, standing in line at the bank, or just being out with people, not necessarily work associates. And I just I had a phone case made. And I that had the, the title and the cover of the book. And I just asked people, hey, what do you think of that? And it was unanimous. First, you get the laughter. And then you get the, oh, my God, I need X copies of that for X number of people <laughs> that I've worked for. I need a copy of that for my current boss. I need a copy of that for all 12 bosses I've had. I need a copy. I need a copy. I need a copy. So there was a thing happening. I like to call it a thing. There was this sort of, you know, research, you know, on you know, this just this new form of research that we were sort of capturing and that without the definition, you ask anyone what's a shitty leader or do you work for a shitty leader or do you know of a shitty leader? And everyone has a question. Everyone has an answer. Everyone has that whole concept of, yeah, I know what a shitty leader is. I work for one. So in that whole sort of hypothesis of the four or 500 people, everyone's reaction was the same thing. And then when we started reviewing that in more detail, what came to my mind was that not one person said, oh, yeah, I'm one. I need a copy of that for me. <laughs> so what we've come to conclude is that shitty leadership, the perception of shitty leadership in the marketplace is that people instantly perceive and identify someone or a few people, 
And then it's something that they believe they're in receipt of. It's not something that they do until you ask the question, well, what about you? When have you ever done that? So I would ask, so what does a shitty leader do? They blame, they shame, they're, you know, they create disengaged workforces. You know, they are, are unapproachable. The list goes on and on. And there's no right or wrong. It's what you perceive shitty leadership to be. But now the whole power of this, when it turns on its ugly head for some, is are you willing to look in the mirror and see whether you're one? Yeah. Because that's when change happens. That's when change occurs, right? That's when the magic happens. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. <laughs> and as I was going through your material, and, and you know, it was funny, I was going through all your Amazon reviews, and everyone's like saying, oh, wow, I got, I got, I need to buy five copies of these books for, you know, people <laughs> in my circle. And, uh, you know, I even thought about it myself. As I heard the title, I'm like, yeah, I know a couple of people I could give the book to. And it, it does take some serious self-reflection to really look in the mirror and say, wow, you know, I have some of those characteristics in some areas, not maybe in every area of my work, uh, but definitely right. there's some areas of improvement for myself. And trust me, I, I'm totally, you know, similar to your story. I, I, you know, I, I have telecom background and IT background and contact center background. So you and I, you know, we've worked <laughs> in the same spaces. And, um, yes, you know, absolutely. Maybe at some, yeah, at some point, maybe we even had the same shitty leaders. Right? <laughs> but... Um, one of the very things, possible. very possible. One of the things was, you know, I was that shitty, you know, like you say, a reformed shitty leader. And it took a long time to really make that transition and, and make that move to, hey, you know what, I'm not as good as I could be, or I'm losing a bunch of my staff on a continuous basis. Uh, how do I retain them? And it just means me getting better. And I'm sure you got much better. And through the book that you wrote, you know, a lot of that comes up. So, as a candidate, so somebody who's going, you're welcome. Uh, so as a candidate who's going through the interview process, you know, they're sitting across the table and ultimately that question of leadership is going to come up. So, you know, if you were going to give advice to one of my candidates, like our audience here around, you know, how do you present the best possible leadership? What would be some of your advice to them? What, that's a great question. So a lot of what I ask, um, I've done, you know, a series of lectures and I, you know, I talk a lot to different groups. I talk to, you know, millennials and I talk to baby boomers and I talk to a combination of all of the above. And one of the things that I find is unanimous across the generations is that in my humble opinion, and I write about this in book one, is to me, the clear number one behavior demonstrated of a non shitty leader is, ready, drum roll, humility. Humility. To me, hands down. <laughs> humility. Absolutely. If you can if you can show genuine, you know, humility to care about another person and to show interest in another person and to take, you know, interest in what it is they're doing. You know, I, I did years ago I did a, a webinar, I did a, a lecture, sorry, with a group of sort of budding leaders. So it was a, a large company in Canada. Um and it was their um future leaders program. So I went in to do a bit of a lecture with them. And I always open those types of le lectures by saying, you know, welcome to leadership. Guess what? It's no longer about you. And that's where you start to learn humility right away. Because as a leader, what do we do? If we look at the delineation between a manager and a leader, again, I'll share my perspective. I yeah. believe we manage, manage process and we lead people. So that's why you won't hear me refer to a group of leaders as managers. Some people do. Some people say it's a play on words. Some people say it's, you know, silly, and that's fine. People are entitled to their opinion. They're entitled to their humble opinion, right? So the way I look at it from my lens is that we manage process and we lead people. Nobody wants to be managed. When you talk, when someone talks about how do you like to be managed, a lot of people will assume micromanagement. They'll think you're looking over my shoulder. You hired me and then you don't trust me. What does that mean? So it's really looking at it from that lens about, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a person. I have feelings. And my feelings are different from other people's feelings and I have needs. So as a leader, if I tap into that and I find the best, what's the best approach with those people at an individual basis, at an individual level? When you tap into that, you will instantly reduce a shitty leadership perception that you have learned <laughs> or that people bestow on you. So, so this is good. So there's two questions that actually comes out of this whole, the, you know, out of your, your, your response. So humility. So how do you, 
So if I were a candidate and I'm sitting in a chair and I'm trying to understand how do I come across humility, but still with strong characteristics of being somebody that somebody wants to hire, right? So, you know, I think about, because at the end of the day, it's not about, sorry, at the end of the day, I still want to be able to show my strengths in addition to showing humility, because that could be a delicate balance, right? So how, how would somebody from, yeah, I think so, right? Showing strength and humility at the same time, showing humility is a strength. So how do you do that? How, how do you specifically do you get into that process of doing it? Well, I think when, you know, if you're sitting on the side of the table where you're being asked the interview questions, you know, mm-hmm. you want to speak with, with eloquence, but you also want to speak with, speak with facts. Hopefully you've mm-hmm. done some research and understanding the person that's interviewing you, potentially the hiring manager. And yeah. you understand their background. So, you know, there's, there's a cautionary tale, but then there's also just the general fact. The general fact is that, you know, if you're interviewing for a role, then interview should be a two-way street, right? Yes. You should be interviewing the, the company just as much as they should be interviewing you. Now, I recognize mm-hmm. at times, you know, people need a job and, you know, that can add in a different layer that's a little different. So I understand that and I get that. But all things being equal, you know, if we're looking at it from an interview, interviewee perspective, you want to be able to answer factually, you want to also be able to show, you know, your people skills. So if you're doing behavior based interviewing, you you can very easily replicate your answers to share personal anecdotes that reflect your engagement with people and how you did things for other people that then led back to those displayed competencies. Now, Mm, it's interesting, the cautionary piece that I'm talking about is that you can when you start to change your lens, when you're thinking about putting others first, and you know, in that regard, you can easily start to see people who are on the other side of the table who, based on their questioning or, or how they carry themselves, may not focus entirely on other people. I remember years ago being interviewed by a gentleman who pretty much the entire time spoke about himself. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, don't you want to know anything I can do? Because why is this about you? It was a very awkward interview. It was a very awkward interview because I'm like, yeah. the whole purpose of this is to ask two way questions, right? Yeah. No, definitely. I, I, I've actually been in your shoes because I've, I've gone through something like that, not necessarily for a role, but for a volunteer position. And yeah. uh, I, I just got so tired of them talking about myself, about themselves, that I ended up turning it into an interview about them. And what was really cool, yeah. the benefit of that, and actually, I mentioned it in the in our book was it became an opportunity for me because they really thought I was very engaging because I was asking them the questions even though I was the <laughs> one. So Absolutely. at the same so but at the same time so when you're doing this back and forth and you're having this conversation uh, you're also like you said you know you're interviewing the person on the other side to make sure that you're a fit. So what are some of the questions that a candidate can ask? person on the other side of the table to determine whether or not they would be a good fit for them. So one of them would definitely be, they're talking about themselves, stay out of the way, but what else could they look for? Well, I like, if I'm interviewing for an interim role or or a job of some kind, and I'm actually meeting the hiring manager who would be my direct supervisor, my boss, Mm -hmm. I always ask, tell me, tell me about your leadership style. Give me some examples of your leadership style. What do you believe is the number one important you know, question to ask in an interview. Um, You know, what are some traits that you look for that defines, you know, good leadership? In most instances, some people, when they interview me, may not know about my book. And depending upon the role, I may not talk about it right away because some people can feel uncomfortable about it. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to call it out. I had one person ask me point blank. So, Mark, um, right off the bat, so am I a shitty leader? (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's a little aw- that's a little awkward for me to ask. But I'm like, but so I turned it around and just had fun with it and said, well, if you're asking me, then you probably already know the answer, don't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's like the best coaching question. Well, so what do you think? <laughs> what do you th- absolutely? What do you? I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? What do you? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. But no, you you know, it's a lot of people go into an interview not thinking that they have any power to ask questions and you certainly don't want to come across sounding coffee and arrogant. You want to, and that's where you can tap into your own humility is, you know, I'm looking to see what from a leadership perspective I can learn and gain in the first 12 to 18 months. So what's your leadership program like? What's your leadership induction like? What are some key areas within leadership development that you would want me to focus on in my first six, 12 months? How much of a people centric culture is this environment? Tell me a little bit about what makes you a people centric culture. 
those kinds of questions, I think, show a lot of strength and power, but also show humility because you're asking about others, but you're doing it in a way that's developmental, that still has that leadership flair to it. So, so this is good. So learning about culture through the actual interview process, actually, this is kind of like, I, I got fireworks going off in my brain right now. Because I, I never really thought about asking the questions to determine the type of culture that you're going into, right? So, well, here's the, so uh, that's great. Yeah, go and ahead, you know what? This is awesome. Sorry, there's a lot of connectivity here because you know I like to ask about culture because you know I, I like to ask for a tour to see because you can see are people engaged when the boss walks by? Do people put their head down or and get back to work? So, is there an element of fear? You know, uh, does, what are people's desk? look like do they have fun stuff do they have pictures are people relaxed and engaging but having fun like you can see very clearly those types of things but there's a number one there's a key element here that i want to share with you and and, and your listeners is that if you think about a company think about any organization that's not 24 by 7 so that has a, a close time so let's say you know a company that has you know 500 people they're monday to friday you know, eight to eight. So Sunday morning at 3 a.m., what's the culture like in that organization? Sunday morning at 3 a.m. So, so I'm, I'm not sure. Explain what, it to me. What, well, if there's no one inside the office and it's empty, then there is no culture because the culture is determined by the people who work there. Mm -hmm. And the people who can influence the culture the most are your senior leaders. So if you have a group of shitty senior leaders, what is that culture going to be like? It's going to be shitty. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when you walk through an organization, you can, if you, if you're armed with that knowledge of what to look for, which I hate to use the term common sense because if it was common, everybody would do it. So really it's uncommon yeah. sense, but it's, but you know, <laughs> from that perspective, if you're armed with that, when you go in an interview, think about how the receptionist greets you. Think about how you're greeted initially. Think about the stuff that you're given prior to the interview. Was it easy to find? Did they tell you where to park? Did they tell you if parking was paid? How much did they actually care about you arriving on time? Mm. Again, that's part of the culture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It actually, yeah, actually, I got so many fireworks going off in my head right now. So, so everything from the initial onboarding, Right. So, you know, somebody coming in the door, even, even making that initial contact, you start as a candidate, you're now, you know, you're now qualifying the, the organization to make sure that they're a fit. Because actually one of the things that Connell and my, so myself and my co-author Connell, one of the things that we're big yeah. on is making sure that you find the right organization that has the same values uh, and the same mission that you do. Right. So that, that you, so when you show up at work, we want to make sure that you're happy. So, Right from the initial contact, from the recruiter all the way into the interview, and even I think you struck on gold when you said, you know, as you're walking through the office, how are people reacting? Right, like this is like wow. Like I, 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 we talked about having that initial conversation with the hiring manager, but it's also keeping your eyes open to what's happening in the environment as you're going through. So yeah. have you? So you've done this. So you've actually asked. The hiring manager for a tour? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would have never... The worst, uh, can say, the worst they can is, say, John, is no. No, yeah. We're too busy right now. We can't do that. But yeah. But if it's somebody who's yeah. welcoming and inviting, is going to say, sure, let me introduce you to the team. I've even done that in the past where I've had candidates that, you know, whoosh, they would shine in, in, the, in the interview room that I'd want to show them to the team as soon as I was done the interview. So... Absolutely. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Ask for the tour. So for the audience out there, and if you're listening in, as you're going through your interview, make sure you ask the hiring manager for the tour. You might get a funny look, but it's also, it helps you stand out, right? And it helps you be different from yeah. all the other candidates that are in the room. Uh, you know, just, just sitting there, waiting, yeah, waiting for the wrap-up. So go ahead, Mark. I don't want to cut yeah. you off. Make sure, no, please, make sure that, you know, if you're going to ask for the tour, that you do it with humility, and that you're also mm. doing it from a place where, you recognize that they might say no, or they might ask why. So be prepared. Mm -hmm. So there's no harm in saying, well, I would love to get an unbiased view of your culture. I'd love to see your culture in action. I just like to see your working environment. Be honest about it. I, Bo, I'm a firm believer that 
you know, what, a lot of what we promote is bold, authentic leadership. Well, how do you become a bold, authentic leader? Authentic being the key word in that. You have to be able to and be willing to hold the mirror up and look inside because sometimes you might not like what you see. And I'm talking about your behaviors. I'm talking about our behaviors. So from that perspective, if you don't get the response you want, handle that with maturity and with business maturity and professionalism. And I wouldn't push it. If they say no outright, that's fine. But at least you've shown an interest in wanting to know and you've been open about, I just want to get a feel for the culture. And the best way to do that is just walking through and seeing it. Wow. If they say no, what are they hiding? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, so, but, so, and to be respectful and being on the other side of the table where, you know, I've had to hire uh, in my past hundreds of people, uh, sometimes it's just a time thing, right? And sometimes, depending on the, yeah, depending on the position you're trying to fill, you know, you got interviews back to back. But no, definitely having those open eyes and just being observant while you're there. Because I know from what I've seen and, depending on the organization that you're applying with, they might take you to a separate space within the organization. That's not close. Absolutely. But if there's they an could opportunity. Also be a secured, yeah, there yeah, could a also be a secured environment. environment where they don't let only, that only employees are allowed in. So obviously if that's the case, then there's not going to be a tour. Yeah. Yeah. No, but definitely. But again, it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, you know what, to tell you, I would have never thought of asking for a tour. Like, wow. And, you know, it, and even on my own, like I've gone out and I've toured other organizations that I really liked. Zappos was one of them down in uh, in Nevada, Las, in Las Vegas. You know, they offer company right. tours. And whenever you get the, whenever I get the opportunity and there's an organization I'm really interested in, I'll see if the organization itself has tours or if they're affiliated with other uh, like United Way, and in, in Canada we have United Way, which is a nonprofit organization which helps people into the workforce. Uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll partner up with certain organizations to offer tours. So it, it's sure. a great way to learn about the organization that way. Wow, Absolutely. This, is, okay. this has been wow. This is. I hope my audience is like really excited because this is some really good stuff. Uh, so thank you. So in terms of. You know, outside of what you've mentioned already, so I'm, I'm, I'm a candidate. I, I really want to show my strongest leadership points. But in addition, there's always ultimately that question. So what's one of your weaknesses or, or one of the things that you struggle with or you're challenged with and you still want to show strong leadership in those responses? What would you say, Mark? Like, What would you advise somebody to, to say? Well, first and foremost, John, the truth. Always the truth. Okay. You know, um, when you tell the truth, you don't need a good memory. So I've always been a firm believer um, in just being authentic and honest about stuff. Because if you make it up, odds are you'll get called out. Or if they could ask you subsequent questions. Um, you know, I use an example of when I worked for Dell. So, and I'm happy to share that quickly with your audience. So, yeah, yeah. you know, every, every year, twice a year, Dell Canada, so Dell Computer Corporation, would do um, the internal... Uh, voice of the employee service um, and this is going back you know this is going back to like early 2000s right so I had inherited a new team and there was about 30 I think I had 38 direct reports at this point so it was quite busy um, they were not contact center folks but they supported they were the back office so they supported the contact center they supported the third party vendors and so on and so I had acquired a whole bunch of people and we were a very large team so they did the confidential survey. And when I got my results, there was a question that was entitled, my manager is effective at managing people. And out of 38 direct reports, I scored 19% favorable. So when you do the math, there were a lot of people who were not happy with my level of leadership competence. So I was fortunately, I worked out of the Toronto office and I was in Edmonton at the time doing some recruiting for the, the West Coast Dell and, you know, had my, you know, private hissy fit in my hotel room for 20 minutes. And then decided that I needed to do something about it. So, you know, I got back to Canada and, uh, you know, a couple of days later and I fired all of them. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so then I decided to, I just wanted to break it up there a bit. So yeah. I called a meeting with my direct and brought them into a room and we chatted. And my initial reaction was, thank you. Thank you for the feedback, because clearly in the few months we've been all working together, there are some disconnects that you weren't comfortable telling me to my face. So as a result of that, we're going to do some work. So I got HR involved. Um, they did a 360 feedback review. 
So I got that feedback. Some great stuff came out of that that I wasn't aware of. And as a result of that, the team and I worked very hard. I had them all agree that their meetings they had confidentially, and this is 38 people agreeing to confidentiality, which, you know, is not easy to do in a corporate environment because, you know, you're going to get some folks that have loose lips, right? But they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anyone to feel called out. I didn't want anyone to feel threatened. If one person had a problem with something I was doing, I wanted to know about it, but I didn't want to know who it was because who it was was irrelevant. And so what, it, what I was able to do was hold the mirror. I held the mirror up and I realized that there, was tr there were trust issues. There were issues where people weren't believing what I was saying. Some of the feedback was, when I say your success is my success, they didn't think I was being sincere. So there was just a, you know, some past legacy issues. There was some stuff. And listen, not everyone's going to like you, but as, as, you're, as the boss, they don't have to like you, but you need to earn their respect. So bottom line, six months later, their tell Dell results were redone, and there were pretty much the majority of the people were similar, and I inverted my score from 19 to 91%. Wow. So I went from 19% favorable to six months later, 91% favorable. I was interviewed by the, the entire leadership team. There was a lot of buzz about it. And it was, the, and ironically, what won the staff over was my diligence in accepting the feedback in the way that I did and the great display of humility because I thanked them for it. And I was sincere. And John, I got to tell you, there were times it wasn't easy. You know, there were times, you know, the bottles of wine outside of work helped. Um, but it was just like, just, just, just be, just be honest. Like just like we're human beings, right? We're all humans. We all have feelings. If something's not working, tell me, but there's that innate fear that many people have about their boss just because they're in a leadership role. And that's not the leader that I want to be. And that's not the leader I try to be. So it was a really good lesson in perception management, understanding humility and making people feel comfortable. And I was able to display it and had great success. So to answer your weakness question, when I'm interviewed, that's the story I tell. Yeah, actually, and that's, yeah, so it's it's a great, and it, so we talk about using the STAR format when you're using uh, interviews, so situation, task, action, task, and result. Action, result, yeah. Yeah, so you've covered all of that in your story, and it was a very compelling story. Actually, we're very big on storytelling in the interview process, uh, because it's Absolutely. the best way to get your examples across. Uh, so a couple of things that and came out of that. Yeah, no, 100%. And, and it's it's hard to forget. It's hard to, you know, some of the things, even when you get really super nervous in an interview, uh, it's hard to forget your own stories, right? Because these are the things that you're going it, through, the emotions that you're feeling, right? You know what else, John? It also is good that your story contains quantifiable data. Because mm -hmm. if someone that wanted to hire me wanted to call Dell for a reference, they could reference, you know, the Tell Dell survey results from 2004, 2005, and that could be verifiable. Yes, yes. Actually, using quantifiable so, data, for sure. That, that even solidifies even more of your story, and you have data points in there to support how you've made that. Yeah, I know that's a fantastic story, and I hope my audience thanks. is hearing this, because this is what we talk about when we talk about storytelling in your interviews, is to show you know, how you made that transformation, but also supporting it with data to even emphasize it even more. So great job there. Absolutely. So, so a couple of things I heard was just being honest, being open, and really being receptive to feedback. So you've done a great job of kind of breaking it down into various points, being open, being honest, being receptive to things so you can make that change. Yeah, well, this is, wow, great stuff. So Mark, Thank you. Um, so if there's... Uh, so we're getting we're getting close to the end. So if there's like a couple of final points that you want to share with our audience around, you know, leadership and the most important aspects of it, what would those points be? Well, I think you know from from my lens, um, one of the greatest things that any leader could do would be to invest in themselves. Invest mm -hmm. in whatever works for you. You know, you can't solve everything on your own. Um, but being able to comfortably look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm a good leader. And, you know, tend to answer the question, why are you a good leader? So many people that I've coached over my career have both professionally and, and you know, business executive, whatever. Um, you know, many people struggle with answering the question, what are you good at? So tell me, skill-wise, tell me what you're really good at. And a lot of times people feel uncomfortable. So they confuse talking about themselves in a way that puts them in the forefront. And I know it's kind of a contradiction about making it about everyone else, but in order to make it about everyone else, you have to make it about yourself first. And that's the development of self-awareness. 
that's the key element of becoming a good leader is recognizing your self-awareness. And the first thing that you can do to answer that question yourself reflectively is, are you self-aware? Most people will say, yes, of course I am. How do you know? Are you self-aware enough to know you're self-aware? So do you know how you react in times of stress? Do you know how people perceive you when you receive feedback? You know, my story would tell, you know, people didn't really know me. People thought I was a bit guarded. But when I demonstrated how I received feedback and I thanked them for it and I put in the time and the effort, they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. They're like, wow, that's a really good leader. That then creates likability. You know, and in anything we know, basic sales 101, it's like no trust, right? No different in leadership, but you can't force it. So holding the mirror up, anyone who is a budding leader, anyone who's currently a leader, who's listening, anybody who wants to get into leadership, leadership is about being courageous. And it's about being courageous within yourself. Learn who you are. <coughs> Learn the leader you want to be versus the leader you think you need to be. And just go out there and figure out how to do that. Figure out what is that best approach. And then from there, things will start to fall into place. It becomes clear. Yeah. Wow. To be a great leader, make it about yourself. Make it about make it about them, but make it about yourself first so you can be that awesome leader. Wow. You make it about yourself first so that you yeah. can then make it about everyone else. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Excellent. So Mark, so if, if people wanted to, to learn a little bit more or you know, if they wanted to learn about what you have and some of the offerings that you know that you put out there, uh, where could you know where could we learn more about you and the various things that you have coming up? Absolutely, John. Well, you can go to www.ego-continuum.com. That is our website. We've got a lot of free stuff on there as far as, you know, some great information, some concepts about shitty leadership, some, you know, things that are the evolution past shitty leadership. So thinking about, you know, organizational and effectiveness and cultural change. Where do you go? Where's the next step after active leadership? And we actually have six more steps that we're in the process of building out uh, active leadership, of course, is number one, because that's where you get to hold the mirror up, um, you know, and yeah, just, you know, we offer a whole, you know, plethora of things um, that are from individual coaching right up to group workshops and 2019, we're going to be looking into our wellness because it's all about body, mind, soul for companies and then getting into some corporate retreats and, you know, building our workshop material to an individual course on ego online and, Lots of stuff coming down the pipe, but feel free to check us out at uh, egocontinuum.com. Awesome. So I will make sure to include the link. So just for the audience members, if you didn't catch the full name, I'll have uh, the name included in the show notes. So you'll have the links in there. So you can just click on it and then, you know, access the site, access Mark material. I know I've gone through his website where I looked at some of the videos that he has there. And even, I believe you have some PDFs that are downloadable, Mark, right? Um, uh, we're also, in the process of, yeah, in the process of building those out. Okay. So yeah, so a lot of great content there, a lot of great information going through it and even just watching some of the videos were pretty insightful. So yeah, no, excellent. Thank you, John. Yeah, yeah. We also have Go one ahead. more thing if I can. We also have, uh, the webinar, which is making shitty leaders less shitty 2.0, uh, <laughs> which you can actually find on YouTube. If you YouTube ego continuum with a hyphen in the middle you'll actually find our 48-minute webinar that's free and a lot of stuff in there. So by all means, we welcome your audience to have a look. Yeah, no, for sure. I'll make sure I'll include the link in for that as well. Well, Mark, thank you Beautiful. for your time today. Thank you for uh, interviewing with us and thank you for sharing all these great nuggets uh, with our audience. Oh, I pleasure. know they're, they're going to walk away with so much great stuff. Uh, so thank awesome. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everybody, My that pleasure, is John. it. <laughs> so everybody this is uh thank you for checking in and listening into our podcast and uh, that'll wrap up the show for today uh, make sure you visit our website www.zerotohire.com to download your free resume guide uh that takes you through and then you can add all of mark's good stuff and good nuggets into that and into the interview process i uh, wish you guys all a great one and we'll talk to you soon
Thank you for listening to the Zero to Hired podcast. Make sure you check out our website, www.zerotohired.com and download your free resume template that's proven to get results, complete with examples and guidelines. Make sure you tune in as we interview leading industry experts who provide tips and strategies to help you get the career that's right for you.